Chapter 16 Signs Their quick-paced ride through the dark slowed when a horrendous thunderstorm blitzed them unexpectedly. They had ridden out many hours of the night, and were just entering the last watch when the moonlight began to disappear, and black clouds rolled in from somewhere in the east toward the ocean. By that point fatigue was beginning to creep up on all of them, including the horses, and Caleb noticed the relief on Layla's face when he suggested they look for a suitable place to rest. The highway ran straight down the middle of Avondale, close to the River Lees. The mountains were too far distant to consider to set up camp, so the only option was to head toward the nearest cluster of forest. They set their sights on a copse that looked thick and quite close, and they steered their animals toward it. The storm hit with surprising vigour, and before they knew it they were galloping at full speed, hoods pulled over their heads and soaked through to the bone as the rain pummeled them from above. The thunder blasted and shook the ground in a merciless assault, and looking back Caleb caught glimpses of his companions when the lightning flashes burst. Layla was close behind riding low on Ollie's back and holding her hood on against the rain, her eyes fixed on the back of Vector. Elastra was cursing and slapping the rump of her mare, her hair flailing wildly behind her. He caught a glimpse of Anselm in the back, trying to stuff his satchel under the protection of his robes while his horse jolted him about. Before he turned back, Caleb caught a glimpse of Leothran riding unperturbed with a stern expression as if she were running a race. Her one yellow eye flickered to him in the darkness. After what seemed like an eternity, they slowed their mounts to a safe speed as they passed under the shelter of the thick elder trees. Rain still shot down between the branches, but it had lessened enough for them to breathe a sigh of relief. Caleb led them to the densest part of the grove, and while he and Anselm dismounted and began fashioning a shelter, the women huddled the horses close together under some lower boughs. Before long they were able to string up one of their larger tent sheets between two trees with some rope, and staking the corners into the muddy ground as far apart as they could, were able to make enough room for all of them to crowd underneath, and for their horses' heads to peek through the entrances on either side, getting them out of the rain and also serving as third and fourth walls. Just in case the storm didn't pass quickly, Caleb and Anselm hurriedly piled pine straw around the edges of the tent sheet as a precaution to keep the cold air out while Alastra, Layla and Leothran worked together to unstrap all of the saddlebags and drag them under cover. The tempest raged on for a good half an hour before it started to quiet, and the sound of the thunder began lagging farther and farther behind the flashes of lightning. It sounds like it is moving west, Layla said as she spread some blankets across the cold ground beneath them. Incredible, Leothran mused, her accent making the word sound even stronger. A storm such as this coming from seemingly nowhere. This would be a strange thing to happen in my homeland. It isn't totally uncommon here in Avondale, Elastra said, wringing her hair out with a grimace. But the storms usually aren't this bad. It should pass soon. That's right, Anselm said. At least this gives us a reason to stop and get some rest, if that's even possible on a night like this. Believe me it's possible, Alastra yawned. Caleb nodded and ran a hand through his hair, shaking out as much rain as he could. Yes, I suppose we may as well stay here tonight. The storm should pass on soon, but there would be no sense riding on tonight with tired animals and muddy ground. Morning should bring us a better road to travel on. Well in that case, Anselm replied, We'd all better get as warm as we can for now, and as soon as this passes we can get a fire going. They all stripped off their outermost layers of clothing, mainly their thick cloaks and gloves, and put them in a pile until they could dry them along with their weapons and boots. Surrounding themselves with their bags and gear, they huddled close together in the tight shelter and listened as the hard beating of the rain outside slowly became a steady hum of light drops above their heads. We've covered a lot of ground tonight, Caleb said. At this rate we should reach Shorewell by noon the day after next. Do you think we will need to fight? Layla asked. Her tone suggested both curiosity and fear. I don't know, Caleb responded. If we do, hopefully you won't have to be a part of it. Leothran, you spent much time with the Talgathians, no? Is there anything else you can tell us about them that may be helpful? Did you learn of their intentions here in the Westerlands, or perhaps their future strategies. Leothran was the only one of them that didn't look totally miserable, crammed under the damp cold tent sheet. She was kneeling down with her hands on her knees, thinking carefully. 
Captivity is not the ideal situation for gaining information, she said bluntly. But while they had me here in the Avondale forests waiting to attack, I was among the ranks of several men of note. One is a half gruel, half man, a vicious and disgusting creature void of feelings beyond the lust for blood. I believe he oversaw the uniting of the gruel clans here, in the name of the Queen. Half gruel, half man. Anselm choked. Fate strike me down. Another, she went on, was a man from somewhere in the Estelands near my home, I think, who came to lead the men of Talgarth. But the one you must know of is Lord Marmius. If I never have to see that man again, I would be grateful. Why is that? Layla asked. He was there the night of the attack, and he is the right hand of Talgarth, taking orders from no one but the lioness herself. I have never seen him bare of his armor or without sword in hand. He is a master of war, a brilliant strategist, and holds dark powers given him by the queen. Powers that are as sinister as the metal face he wears over his head. Metal face? Caleb asked. So it was him. We saw him during the battle for Tritus. He looked like a giant and wore a horned helmet with some sort of demonic face. My father crossed swords with him even as I was taken up into the sky. Leothran nodded. Some amongst the enemy ranks said his powers are somehow connected to the mask. I know little more than that, I'm afraid, she replied with an apologetic bow of her head. I have heard many whispers of what lies beneath that mask, stories of what he has done to many a brave man, but none can I fully understand. The tent had grown very silent as they all listened intently. Layla had slid closer to Caleb and was staring off at nothing with a look of concern. In the silence, they recognized that the rain had almost dissipated entirely. Well, that's enough ghost tales for me for one night, Anselm said as he blew into his hands. I'm freezing, and if we want a comfortable sleep tonight and dry boots tomorrow, we'll need a fire started. He fished through his bags and at last pulled out a wooden tinderbox shut tightly with golden clips, and a bag that contained his flint and steel striker. There's never been a time that I couldn't start a flame, he said with a smug grin. We'll have a fire blazing in no time. Elastra rolled her eyes. There's never been such a time for me either, brother. A first-degree hex could do the trick nicely. Typical L, he said back as he pushed his way out between the horses. Why sacrifice the memory and energy for even a small hex when mere skill can get you through just fine? He didn't wait for the answer before he left. I will assist him, Leothran said. I can get the horses tied to a tree as well now that the storm has slowed, and give them their feedbacks. They like this weather anyhow. Caleb got the feeling she didn't like being confined to a tight space like their shelter. She was out of sight moments later, and Anselm's head popped back into the tent thereafter. Curse it all my strikos missing, he grumbled. Layla. You're the steel expert. Would you mind fishing yours out? I'll try to find some more dry wood if you want to meet me out there. Layla grasped for an excuse, but since she nodded in the meantime, Anselm vanished again. Caleb analyzed the situation. Layla despised leaving Caleb alone with Elastra. She veiled her feelings quickly. I am going to be the first to feel the heat from the fire, she said as she rummaged through her pack, feigning disinterest. Once she located her striker, she pushed her soaked red hair out of her face and with one last glance at the two of them crawled out shivering. Caleb shifted uneasily as she left. He did not wish to make the situation worse. He waited as the horses' heads one by one left the cover of the tent, leaving a cold breeze in their place. He moved to exit and find a productive chore, but Elastra spoke before he could leave. This rain is a cursing from fate directed straight at me. I despise ill weather. She threw her sleeping blanket around herself and shook more drops from her hair. Are you all right? Caleb asked. He could faintly see her smile in the dark. Sure. Though this helpless woman will be glad once she is dry. Much had changed since Caleb had first met her and Anselm when they had arrived in Tritus with the travelling troop of bards. Back then, she was a simple runaway from Faldesia with grand ambitions. Ambitions that eventually made her a sage. Caleb thought from the beginning that she was a peculiar woman, different from others in every way, for better or worse. He enjoyed watching her antics as he and Anselm got to know one another, 
but never associated with her much until he first travelled to Grimhall three years back. He had gone with King Hallis to meet King Rawland when he was first captain, and with them came the high sage Fridmorton and his new sage Alastra Flitchett. It was then that they were able to talk, mostly about the politics of their stations, but as they saw each other often at the castle they quickly became close comrades. On Alastra's part, it was clear she wanted more from their friendship. It is no wonder Layla thinks so foully of her, Caleb thought. And he did not blame her for it. Alastra sniffed in the cold. You are hardly helpless, Caleb chuckled. And just what is that supposed to mean, she japed in return. You have become quite the warden since we visited Grimhall together. You have accomplished everything you set out to do, and have been invaluable to Tritus. He fell silent, listening for a moment to echoes of the flint stone striking the steel outside. He pondered on that journey to the now ruined Grimhall. The city was so noble then and King Rawland so inspiring. He looked down at the hands that drove a sword through his body. Rawland's frightened eyes stared up at him again. He suddenly felt Alastra's hand on his own which somehow was warm to the touch. She had moved closer and was looking at him with concerned eyes. High Sage Fridmorton always told me, she said. When a life is in jeopardy, there is no time to delay making a choice, and it had better be the right one. Or something to that effect. I forget. But that's what you faced at Grimhall, Caleb. You acted and I, for one, stand by your decision. You were protecting Tritus. Caleb looked at Elastra's face surrounded by doused hanging curls and smiled. Thank you. I'll always stand by you, she said. You know that, don't you? You've always known that, she added a shade too earnestly for comfort. Caleb was comforted by her words but now was not entirely sure what to say and felt he was in the wrong place. He glanced down at her hand still resting on his. I know. They heard the crack of wood outside and light from the fire showed through the tent. Come, Caleb said, relieved to pull away. They have the fire going. We had better get warm while we can. The ground was muddy, but the rain was no more than a trickle as they emerged from the tent to see the welcoming blaze of Anselm's fire. Anselm and the women were already sitting close on a group of stones and had their boots propped near the flames. Anselm was inspecting each of his things from his satchel for water damage with a wary eye, including each individual page in his record book. They were well into the last watch now with only four hours left until sunrise. After placing their wet things strategically around the fire, Anselm brought out his long pipe and played a soft tune, the pitch being slightly off from the sudden intake of moisture from his bag, while the rest of them grew warmer and more tired with each note. The tune was called The Bidding of the Breeze, a melancholy song not well known in Avondale but was one of Anselm's favourites from his travels with the bards. It set a rejuvenating air about them, and one by one they each retired to the shelter of the tent sheet, rolling up in their blankets and lying shoulder to shoulder, until Caleb was finally able to leave the fire to join them. Anselm insisted on sleeping where he was to keep the fire fueled during the rest of the night. Caleb opened his eyes. It must be nearly dawn. As his vision adjusted, he looked at the shapes of each of his companions in the dark amidst the piles of saddles, packs and weapons. The spot next to him was empty. Layla. He was instantly on the alert. At once, Caleb crawled out of his blankets and into the cold dark of the very early morning. It wasn't until he was out of the tent that he realized he had brought his one-handed dueling sword with him. The loud, rhythmic sound of the singer bugs had replaced the sound of rolling thunder but otherwise all was still. The horses stood with their heads bowed twenty paces away under the branches of a tilted elder, and the fire had been reduced to a small flicker on a few charred chunks of wood. Anselm laid at its feet with his head resting on a stone, fast asleep in a blanket, a pile of wood within hand's reach. He had done a worthy job keeping the flames alive while he rested. He scanned their camp hastily, and was relieved to see Layla's figure not far off amongst the trees. She was sitting on a rock with her back to him, wearing her cloak and hood. She turned suddenly as he walked up behind her, nearly leaping to her feet with surprise. Oh! Caleb, you startled me. He smiled and stuck his blade into the mud beside the rock and sat down next to her. What are you doing out here? Is there something wrong? 
Her face held an expression of deep concern, and she pulled her cloak tighter around her at the question. No, it's nothing really. Nothing indeed, Caleb said knowingly. What is it? Tell me. She shook her head. I, it was just a dream I had. I can't really sleep now. That's all. A dream. Caleb shrugged and breathed an inward sigh of relief. What kind of dream? He waited for her to answer, watching her perplexed expression as she tried to gather her thoughts. I do not know. Someone was watching us tonight. And then my vision changed, thought you were there and some other people too. I saw the armoured man, that Lord Marmius and your father also, but mostly a man in Talgarth garb whom I have never seen before, someone my mind conjured up I suppose. It was just a dream, Caleb reassured her. All sorts of strange emotions come with them. Some we can explain, others we cannot. I know, Layla said quietly. But that man I saw, I saw him as a boy by a shore of red cliffs. I saw him as a young man. It is like I saw his whole life, only I can't remember. But his face was so real, as if I knew him from some distant memory. Caleb was not sure what to say. He rarely dreamed. When he did he mainly dreamed about his mother, but since he had never met her before, his conjured images of her always looked different, and he knew it was just the mere wanderings of his subconscious thoughts. They were just dreams. I know I'm talking nonsense, she said. It is just that it was so real. I can see that man's face so clearly. You know how dreams can be. Caleb put his arm around her and she rested her head on his shoulder, still gazing at the ground in deep thought. Caleb tried to ignore the cold air and hold back the shivers, letting his mind wander back into his own thoughts, slowly taking him back towards sleep. Shock filled him suddenly when Layla gasped and gripped at his shirt so hard he thought she meant to tear it from him. Both of them stopped breathing as she pointed through the dark cluster of tree trunks to a spot a hundred paces away between two large elders and a fallen trunk. Caleb's eyes searched frantically until he saw it, the distorted shape of a man against the pale light of the moon. Caleb grabbed his sword instantly and crouched low, slowly pulling Layla down off of the rock to his side. It was terribly hard to make out details in the Pradorn, but he could see that the person was shrouded with some kind of clothing that hid his arms and legs, revealing only a vague outline of shoulders and a hooded head. Caleb was shocked to see that even from the distance it was clear the person was disturbingly tall, at least eight spans Caleb guessed, and was nearly as thin as the trees it stood amongst. The form didn't seem to be moving toward them but rather just stood and swayed back and forth, just enough for them to be able to detect movement. Caleb's brain began to devise possibility after possibility. A scout from Talgarth. A gruel. Someone from Tritus. No. What in the name of fate? Both of them watched intently as the thin shape stood there. Caleb began to wonder if their eyes were deceiving them, and they had been staring at some kind of mossy timber when suddenly the figure moved. It turned ever so slowly away from them, and disappeared back into the trees. Fate almighty, what was that? Layla's voice quivered. Caleb hadn't noticed, but Layla had also drawn her short sword, and it rattled in her trembling hand. I have no idea, Caleb answered without taking his eyes from the spot where it had stood. Go back to the tent and try to sleep for the last while before sunrise. I'll follow and wake Ansel, and we will keep a watch until then. He paused in thought. Whatever it was, it wanted nothing to do with us tonight. It took a moment for Layla to work up the courage to turn her gaze from the trees ahead, but she soon stood, holding her cloak closely around her and let Caleb guide her back into the tent. He knew she would not sleep any more that night. At long last the sun peered above the treetops, and not soon after the three women made their way out of the tent, Layla still wrapped in her cloak and looking around cautiously, Elastra rubbing her eyes and tripping on roots sticking out of the damp ground, and Leothrin seeming wholly fresh and alert, her weapons already strapped on and her one visible eyebrow lowered in determination. The morning was cold and damp, but even the tiny rays of light flickering through the leaves of the pleasant glade dissipated the fear of the previous night. Anselm sat by the fire which he had revived to a roaring flame, warming some of the food they had brought for breakfast. Caleb stood near the fire with his back turned to them, looking into the trees. His broadsword was on his back, and his one-handed sword he held at the ready in his hands. 
What is wrong? Leothran asked right away. Her hands went to the two blades at her sides. Nothing for now, Caleb said. Everyone eat as quickly as you can. We need to be back to the highway and into the open within the hour. He told me what happened last night, Anselm said to Layla as he stirred the food around. Some guard I proved to be sleeping on the job. You couldn't have known, Layla said. But it is a good thing I was awake. Will somebody please explain what's going on? I never cared for guessing games, Elastra spouted as she moved toward the food. Anselm handed her a portion as he elaborated. There isn't much to be said. Caleb and Layla saw something here last night. They think some person was watching our camp not more than a hundred spans away. We've kept a good watch since but have seen nothing else. Elastra and Leothran looked up in surprise. Well, what did he look like? Elastra asked. Why didn't you wake us? We couldn't see much, Elastra, Layla answered. And as soon as we noticed him, he stalked back into the trees. Elastra tore a piece of meat with her teeth. A Talgothian. Or just a simple traveller, perhaps. Maybe he lost his way and left to find somewhere to sleep alone. Perhaps, Layla said, looking into the trees. But something tells me he was looking for something. Whether it was us or not, I cannot say. Apparently it wasn't, Elastra concluded with her mouth full. Caleb finally sheathed his sword and turned from his watch. I'll get us packed and saddled up, he said. On our way out, I want to examine where we saw our visitor. The sun continued to rise steadily higher, as if the highway was beckoning them back east to its trail. In no time it was bright with a morning shine, and they could already feel the faint heat of the day as they finished covering the fire and mounted. Their main gear was dry enough to wear with the exception of their boots, the thick leather retaining much of the moisture, but their first few hours of riding under the sun would finish the job. Together Caleb and Layla led the way, and in a few minutes they stopped at the crest of a tiny hill by the fallen trunk they had seen in the night. Caleb dismounted and began inspecting the ground while the others watched. He could be grateful for the rain in this instance, it left clear tracks. The ground on the hill had mostly dried, but the fresh markings were easy to see and plain to read. They all marveled at the long boot imprints left in the soft earth. They were nearly twice the size of Caleb's foot, and marched in a straight decided line from the east where the road was to the top of the hill, and stopped abruptly as if whoever it was had had no other thought whatsoever of taking an alternate path. There is no question about it. He came straight to us. Caleb. Come look at this, Anselm called from further east down the hill. They all rode toward him. More footprints were scattered all over, and these were even easier to see than the last. They were large marks, almost claw-like, with two thick talons on the front and one in the back. Each of them was nearly as long as Caleb's form. Dozens of these prints were strewn in every direction, seeming like whatever it was had been moving in circles. Before anyone could analyze the tracks, Leothran trotted up and stamped right over them. Fendara. Come again. Anselm voiced for everyone. I am familiar with these tracks, Leothran said. They are that of a beast called Fendara. I am not aware of a name for them in the common tongue, but my people have encountered them in the Great Waste. Everyone gasped. The Great Waste? Few have ventured into those parts and returned, Caleb said. Are you certain? I am certain. The Sartir journeyed through all of the far reaches including the Great Waste before they settled here, and to this day we scout the region still in search of new emanations to mimic. Caleb saw a moment of sadness settle into her face and remembered that she had lost that precious gift. She continued. There are countless creatures in those wilds. Many still unknown to any man but the Fendara we have seen. None desire to learn to take their shape. They are vicious hunters, and we kill them when we find them. She examined the ground more carefully with her one eye. Yes. These are Fendara. At least ten of them. Being tracked by a pack of monsters from the Great Waste. Anselm grumbled, leaning further down to look at the tracks. But if they were sent by the invaders, why would they not attack us? Layla thought aloud. Caleb looked back up and pointed in the direction of the highway. I'd rather not wait to find out. Let's ride. 
and keep your weapons close. We've a long way to shore well yet. He kicked Vector into a fast stride as soon as they left the cover of the woods, ignoring the blinding sunlight. Father, are they hunting you too? I am almost there. Thank you for listening. Subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss the next chapter. Episodes go live every Monday and Friday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The audiobook can be purchased in its entirety on Google Play Books. Get the whole trilogy now in both paperback and ebook formats. All links are in the description.